University of Vienna, so Lasso Scanner Park in Vienna, Hans Bruder Schmidt, and he will be talking about social ontology and conceptual content. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the Alavid team very much for this wonderful workshop. I, I, I feel we are sort of coming together and we're moving closer and but I still hope I hope there is still some disagreement left so that we sort of can play this in a competitive way. You know there are you know suggestions that make me think, you know, Preston we're always there, almost there, right? If you slot a collective intentionality at the beginning as the base of it all, uh, I think we might be able to reach an agreement within three years. Yeah, financing for and uh, this has been a highlight uh, in my view of, uh, of our cooperative work and I want to thank the RBS team and in particular Preston very much for its great efforts. It's just wonderful, you know, with all the food and hotel and the organization <laughs> and all the content. Thank you. I have a lot of help. So thank you. Checks and I would certainly appreciate your comments and your help in finishing this paper. So that's still an option right now, but what I have and what I modified a little bit this morning is a presentation on Aristotle's claim that we are no more social than other animals. So can I take a quick vote? Uh, who's for Aristotle? More social than other animals. More social. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's a majority. <laughs> And, and before I start, I still need your help because um, so uh, this conference is called Foundations of Sociality. Foundations of what again? Sociality is that the word you use? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you just praise the conference. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and well, no, foundations of sociality. That's a topic in social ontology, and, and it's we made social. social Social ontology, our keyword, our password, and I just accepted to edit the, the Routledge handbook on social ontology. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, historically minded, and one of the first things I did when we decided to put social ontology in the title of our journal was to use Google's Ngram viewer to find out about the origin of the word. So who invented social ontology? Many people think they did. <laughs> like Carol, Carol Gould once said she, she invented it and she has this book in Marx and Social Ontology, Michael Poynis and his Social Ontology in the title in the 60s, uh, Gould in the 70s. Uh, Searle thinks he's invented the label. But what I found on by the Ingram viewer, and I tried a couple of European languages, French, Italian, German. English, not many more, I think these are the languages I, I use on, on Google's Ngram Viewer, you know Google's Ngram Viewer, right? You can browse the entire database of Google Books with that tool. And the earliest um, uh, use of the word social ontology I found was from the memorable year, 1871, when France was invaded by Prussian troops as a direct consequence <laughs> of the victory of Königgrätz. So that was a direct consequence of what happened here that they then invaded France. And in French, in, in France uh, there was a slogan, a motto that was uh, publicly used and that was uh, Revanche pour Königgrätz. So they used that as a motto because they felt very much for the Austrian uh, Empire and they, they knew what was going to happen, that it would be them next. And uh, yeah, that's so we're going back to 1871 and we find a book, and that's called Doctrine Républicaine, ou Principe Naturel et Économique d'Ontologie Sociale. So that's the first use of the word social ontology I could find. And it is by one L.P. Massip, 
And here is the passage that introduces the word social ontology. Eh bien, nous disons, uh, uh, well then, we say, we, that if the French Revolution has uh, produced uh, a new order of things, the, or the economic order, uh, and if it has uh, given, uh, if it has uh, raised uh, Enfanti, uh, a new being, uh, the political society, there must be, for this order of things, for this new order of things, for this new uh, entity, new laws and a new science of those laws. The science of this being and the study of these laws is what I will call, with a new word, with a new name, l'ontologie sociale, social ontology. Uh, social ontology will be, for us, the study and the analysis of laws and the force of natural forces and civil forces that, uh, following the principles of justice and of liberty, uh, work together uh, in the production and appropriation uh, to the exchange and the consummation of the economic cons consummation of riches and to the, uh, the greatness and the prosperity, the individual greatness and prosperity and social uh, greatness and prosperity of a nation. So it's, it's introduced in, in the spirit of, uh, so obviously it's referring positively to the French Revolution and uh, it is within a nationalist discourse that we find the origin of the expression uh, social ontology and it's not entirely clear what these, these uh, laws are. There, there is natural laws but it's obviously also the ontologies that are to be studied in social ontology. Now, uh, this Masik guy, I, I'm curious about him, and I'm desperate to find out who he is. I'm assuming a he. Uh, there is this other book on l'individualisme by the same author, and uh, of course I, I want to find out about Masik, and I, I used uh, La Bibliothèque Nationale Française, uh, they have this Gallica database. So, and then there is uh, something uh, he, together with a couple of people, handed to a sort of a petition to the Assemblée Nationale that I could find. And I could also find uh, something in the, in the library, from the library of Giuseppe Garibaldi where it says that this massive guy sent his book, La Doctrine Bénédicte to Garibaldi, and it's still in his library, but it says about the book, Esempio in Donzo, the last expression here, Esempio in Donzo, and that means that Garibaldi, you know, these, these are all French books, I don't know if, you, if you've ever encountered these, these books with, you know, these soft covers, and uh, they, you buy them uh, printed and folded, but not cut. So you have to cut them up. And esempio in donzo means that Garibaldi didn't cut it up. He didn't read it. So that's what I, well, I, I, I found some newspaper articles. Here is a Louis-Pierre Massif, and he's obviously a, a wine merchant in, uh, in Nîmes. But I, I couldn't find anything about the guy other than that. Reading his work and getting the impression of a provincial administrator with a lot of time at his hands. He's not like, he's obviously learned, but he, he doesn't strike me as a person who is in an, is, is in an actual debate with, with leading figures of his time. So I, I think he might be in a provincial position, but I'm not sure. And I'm, I'm asking you to help me. So uh, how do I find about, out about this massive guy? It could be a non 
Bloom, Scott Bloom uh, pseudonym. The, uh, the books are also heavily anti-Catholic, so that's the most basic thrust of these works, is anti-Catholic church. It's decidedly secular and it's militantly secular. So it could be a non de Bloom, it could well be. I, I don't know, and I want to find out because uh, somebody has to write about this guy because it seems that he invented the label. Now, of course, the idea of social ontology goes way further back. And uh, yeah, there we are. So if Kant is the grand grandfather, what does that make Aristotle? <laughs> grand, 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 grand. And he has this passage in the first book of his politics. And I, I, I think it's, it speaks to us. Many of the talks of the Presti should have us talk about the human world. How does this fit into the non-human world? Or Philip's paper on how our cooperation versus uh, cooperation of our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. And Aristotle says something about this, and it's, it's, uh, it's rightly famous the passage. So here is what Aristotle wants to do at this point is uh, to explain how human sociality differs from the sociality of, of other animals. And he says in the passage preceding this quote that humans are more social could be a quantitative difference, could be a qualitative difference, expressions more social than other social animals. The word he uses is, uh, the objective is uh, politicos, meaning, you know, how could we translate it? I think he, he mentions the bees as political animals, and does he mention the wolves, you know? So one is a hive and one, one is a pack, and these are forms of sort of living together. So there, I think that's the basic difference. So there are animals that live together and animals that do not live together. And here, here is how humans are different from other animals that live together. And I'm quoting the Rackham translation here. So this is H. Rackham. And uh, this is an often quoted translation because it's in the Loeb Classical Library and many people choose Loeb's Classical Library uh, for the purpose of reading Aristotle. And uh, the, the translation goes as this. The mere voice. So that's what other animals have. They have mere voice. Phone. It is true, can indicate pain and pleasure, and therefore is possessed by the other animals as well. For their nature has been developed so far as to have sensations of what is painful and pleasant, and to indicate those sensations to one another. But speech is designed to indicate the advantages and the harmful, and therefore also the right and the wrong. For it is the special property of man in distinction from the other animals that he alone has perception of good and bad and right and wrong and the other moral qualities and his partnership in these things that makes a household and the state city state. There's a lot in this passage, but I want to draw your attention to a problem of this translation. And it comes to the fore if we compare the terms I, I printed in bold in the Greek and in the translation. So I highlighted uh, here two terms. Uh, Reckon translates sensations and perception. So um, perception is what we have, and sensations of good and bad is what other animals have. Uh, this is not good because Aristotle in the original uses the same word, aesthesis. So it's not a good idea to use different words for what uh, Aristotle refers to with the same word. Also with uh, indicate as the obverse problem. Uh, so it's all about indicating in 
Rackham, but that's not true to the original because Aristotle says that uh, the role of phone is uh, semine. It's a semeion and it's thus semine. Whereas the role of, uh, of logos in humans is to delune. So here Aristotle makes a difference between what the phone does in other animals and what logos does in humans. It's not the same word, semine versus the loon. And I checked a couple of more because I, I found that irritating. How could you... So I checked a couple of other uh, translations that are still used and I found the same problem here in uh, Benjamin Joet. So uh, there is perception or having a sense, different words for the same Aristotelian term, hypothesis. And there is indication and intimation and set forth. So it's, it's still different words, but it's indication and intimation should be the same word. It's said se my name and se meion. So that's the same word, one is a substantive and the other is a verb, a verb but it's, it's the same root. And, and the moon is translated as, uh, as set forth. Then there is uh, William Ellis. So this is good, perceived perception for hypothesis, at least it's the same word. But uh, uh, being a token of for semine, semeion uh, does not uh, keep uh, the, the similarity to, to this, the same root uh, Aristotle uh, uses for imparted, and then impart is used for in part and express is used for the moon. So why, why is this such a drama? It's because obviously the passage is trying to make a comparison. And if you're going to compare stuff, you should, you should keep the, you know, you, if there's got to be tertium comparationis and the differences. And you blur it if you don't keep it straight. So you, you don't understand Aristotle if you don't keep the words. And uh, that's what I found most surprising. But I checked then in the recent literature, there's Christopher Reeve. I always thought it was Superman who was called Christopher Reeve. But there is this classic scholar, but he does translate like a Superman because it's all good with him. So he, we're not discussing whether this is the right translation, we're just discussing does he keep the words, and he does. And in a way it seems that we return into old virtues of translating because the earliest translation that sort of brought Aristotle back into the Western world, and I still think it's a terrific feat and rightly uh, and laudably, tremendously influential for the intellectual development that in the 13th century one William of Moorbecke translated Aristotle into Latin. And that's how, you know, it was all uh, platonic before that, all Augustinian thought, and only in the 13th century via the uh, North African world, um, Aristotle came back to the West. And uh, William of Moorbecke keeps it straight. So, Eisthesis is uh, sensare, sensum, signum, uh, significant, manifestandum. So, this is how, this is how William of Moorbecke translates the moon, manifestare. So, that's what, what Logos does, is manifestare, whereas what uh, Fone does is uh, significare, manifestare and significare, different words, different ideas. So how, how shall we understand this comparison that's going on in Aristotle? I think there are three layers to this, layers of comparison. There is uh, one point Aristotle makes uh, that obviously concerns the content of, let's call it cognition, right, where 
where uh, non-human political animals have ice disease of pain and pleasure. Whereas humans have ice disease of the good and the bad, etc. The advantages and disadvantages of the good and the bad and the right and the wrong. He mentions three, three contents of cognition. So we have different contents of cognition. Also, uh, there is a, a comparison concerning the, I call it the mode of communication. So the non-human political animals have four names, two semi-names, pain and pleasure, whereas we have logos to delun, the good and the bad, etc. So that's, that's a different mode of communication, whether you whether it is about semi name by a phone or whether it is to delun by a logos. And the third layer is the, yeah, I call it the type of sociality, although I'm a few terribly uncomfortable with that word. So non-human political animals, they are together in human pleasure, whereas we have koinonia, in the good and the bad. I'm not sure whether Aristotle would say, well, this is actually also a kind of koinonia. He doesn't say so in this passage. That's why I'm not quoting koinonia here. I, but I sense he would probably say it is a form of koinonia. So, three layers of comparison, and uh, as you know, uh, so modern social thought is but a footnote to Aristotle. Uh, there are various interpretations of what's, what's the basic point here, what's, what's, what's the difference that makes a difference. So how, how are we, how, how are we essentially different from our closest relatives, from, from all of our relatives? And I distinguish three lines of interpretation and uh, each takes a different line to be the one that really does the work. And the first line is what I call the Kantian line. And it says it's all about the content. You know, if, if, if your cognition is about uh, the pleasurable and the harmful, the pleasurable and the harmful have a subjective nature. So it's pleasurable or harmful for you. Whereas the right and the wrong and the good and the bad potentially, the good and bad is not so clear from the outside, but it's, it's pretty clear concerning justice, dikayon and adikon. So right and wrong is actually not a very good translation, I should say, the just and unjust. Because Aristotle says dikayon, dikayosune, Justice and Dikayon is the just, and Adikon is the unjust. So, what's unjust is not just unjust for me, it is, it is the nature of the content that its, let's call it focus, is not singular, it's not just for me. You know, if I say, well, this is, might not be just for you, but it's just for me, I'm not understanding the con concept, right? And the Kantian line is to say that this is what makes us more social, that the content of our cognition is general in nature. So we're dealing with general stuff. And that's what entangles us into this whole reason stuff. You know, the stuff that Yada was talking about. With, with this law and with everything universal and all of that stuff. It cannot be just for me. It's, it, it entails the idea of, you know, open generality. And, uh, and according to the Kantian interpretation, that's, that's what Aristotle discovered, you know. That's, that's the thing about uh, us being the animal with logos. Is uh, our being bound by general rules. So, uh, the second line, uh, you might call it Wittgensteinian, and it is certainly 
not worked out by Aristotle, and but the idea is very popular nowadays still, I think, and uh, the idea here is that uh, human communication is social in a way non-human communication is not. So voice gives signals, speech makes statements. Making a statement is a move in a normative social practice that involves other participants. So a human political community is robust because human communication is a practice which is intrinsically social. I never saw a convincing argument for, for that claim, but that's certainly a prominent view in the literature. And the third line is, uh, I'm very sympathetic with that line, is that differences in type of sociality, that human community or togetherness is social in a way non-human community is not. Non-human sociality is a matter of an aggregate of individual cognitions and intentions, common pains and pleasures, distributively. Human sociality is a matter of shared cognition and of jointly striving after common purposes, the common good, collectively. So here the argument is that human political community is robust because humans have collective intentionality, which is intrinsically social. Well, it's certain nice, this is uh, common sense, and uh, I, I do think that the, I have now taken very software to try to find the roots of the idea of common sense in, in the way Aristotle uses aesthesis in friendship. And, but, but, but that's another box. Aristotle is never never really explicitly uses in aesthesis in, in a way that brings together different subjects. He doesn't do that. He uses in aesthesis as the working together of different senses. But the tradition that has picked up on Aristotle very quickly uh, turns in aesthesis into the sensus communis, which is decidedly social. So even, even in, in Aquinas you find that later became our common sense. Of course, now we understand common sense is distributive, common sense is what everyone, for him or herself, thinks. But if, if the root is correct, it's originally a collective notion. It's an act of proceeding together. So this is all well, but uh, is it true? I mean, is, is it this whole talk about shared cognition of the good and the just. That is pluralism. Maybe it's true for the household. So Aristotle says it. It makes poie, it makes the oikos, the household, and the polis. The koinonia toyuton. And toyuton refers to Aesthesis of advantages and disadvantages of the good and the bad, of the just and unjust, that makes a household. But, let's face it, we have different conceptions of the good and the bad, advantages and disadvantages, the just and unjust. And, moreover, Aristotle knows that. This is how he starts it. Well, you know that politics is together, it belongs together with the Nicomachean ethics, right? If you read it through, at the end of the Nicomachean ethics, he says, well, now we can turn to the politics. It's one thing. Ethics and politics <coughs> is one thing. And at the beginning of the Nicomachean ethics, what does Aristotle do? He, in a topical procedure, he discusses the different conceptions of the good there are. So obviously he knows that people have different conceptions of the good. How then can he say it's koinonia toyuto, koinonia in the aesthesis of the good that makes the household and the city? How can we live together? Given, and you know, living together, koinonia, uh, Aristotle conceives of it as a, as a joint activity. 
So he explicitly says about koinonia, this is a form of activity. It's joint activity. Being active together. So how can we jointly be active together under different conceptions thereof? And he could have turned liberal. <laughs> but he didn't. <coughs> but it leaves us with, the, I guess, the basic problem of political philosophy. I happen to be a professor of political philosophy, so I have to, you know, at some point I have to address issues of political philosophy. And this is a paper where I try to do so in connection with my work on, on collective intentionality. Now, let me first say a word on the three lines. I do not think that these three lines are particularly convincing. Concerning the Kantian line, the point is that the general form of the content of our cognition does not constitute an agreement. And that's a basic mistake. Kant was such a smart guy. But he sort of made a category mistake um, uh, by uh, confounding logical generality with community. So the fact that, that we operate with general concepts does not make us agree. Quite to the opposite, it is the sort of the sharpest conflicts that occur between humans. This is why our wars tend to be maybe more violent than <coughs> other creatures. Because the, the opponent is not just, you know, operating under self-interest, but he betrays the truth. You know, he's an enemy in a much sharper sense because he sort of he, he opposes uh, the general truth. So you know, have to have the idea of justice doesn't make you agree with more people. It, it tends to make you, uh, to bring you in a, into a sharper opposition uh, to others who disagree with you. Because they basically should agree, right? You have a, you, what you have in mind is justice, and now they oppose you, so they oppose justice, so you're going to fight them much harder than if it's just an, an interest for a goodie or something, something like that. So that, that's just... Uh, that's just not true. That well, it's basically the fact of ideological conflicts that's, um, that's sort of uh, not highlighted or forgotten in the Kantian line of thinking about the Aristotelian claim. Now, the second line, the uh, 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 the common striving, and uh, it seems questionable how there could be anything like common striving for a common good if we have different conceptions thereof. How, how, is, how is it not just a mistake to think that we are living together if we are living together under different conceptions thereof? And proper joint acceptance of the basic structure of social reality implies a shared conception of the basic structure where there is no such conception, any extension overlap of what is accepted is merely coincidental, so it doesn't give us robustness. And obviously, Aristotle wants a robust notion of sociality, an essential, it's an essential point he's making. It's not saying that well, we happen to sort of live under favorable circumstances that allow us to um, uh, get along with each other, even though we have totally different conceptions, but he wants to make a, a, a point about a robust form of sociality. And it seems to be that if we have different uh, conceptions of the good and the just, the use of the same words doesn't really help us because it's just empty noise, BS, air sound, when we use uh, words in different, uh, in different meanings. So, how, how, how is it possible? I mean, so far it seems to be a fact that we're sort of living together and it seems possible to say it is a joint activity, right? Sort of living together. But 
but we have different conceptions thereof. And political philosophy has at least two promising candidates to, to explain how it can happen. One is the idea of an overlapping consensus, the famous Rawlsian uh, proposal where he says, well, you know, we, we thought the first thing is that we acknowledge that there are different conceptions of the good. And then uh, there is, uh, there's going to be, under some circumstances, it needs some fortune, some historical good fortune, but if we have that good fortune, there's going to be this overlap. And this overlap is on principles of fairness. So it's not on the guise of the good that we really live together, but on the principle of fairness. And fairness is something that can be derived from, from the point of view of any conception of the good, if it's sort of reasonable. And, and this is a second sort of value that then comes to command our allegiance and that's the value of fairness. In some places in his work he also says he has this two-partite moral psychology where he says well, there, is, there is striving for the good but then there is also this sense of fairness as a second motivational component in our uh, moral psychology and I don't buy that. I, I, I think that's, that's well, it, it's not argued for in any empirical sense and it doesn't seem plausible to me because with fairness there is always the question of what good it is. But what, it, it leaves open the question of fairness, okay, so fairness say everyone is or how do some principle. It's always going to be the open question of what good it is. Whereas striving for the good, what good it is, well, it's the good that's being strived for. It doesn't leave open that question. So obviously, fairness, whatever it is, is sort of on a different level. It cannot be on a par with, uh, with striving for the good, because fairness is open to the question of what good it is. And uh, also there is plenty of, of difficulties with Wall's idea. is that it was one way of deriving uh, we, we could, I mean, this is not only of course Rawls develops this for normative stuff but we could also develop it for descriptive stuff right? it's not only with regards to, uh, to uh, values that we disagree but also with regards to uh, descriptions descriptions of social reality these descriptions contain functions, and functions involve values, so there isn't really a clear-cut distinction where the social reality is, is concerned because the ontology of the social is a deontology. It's always on the understanding of what it is for that we conceive of social facts. So, but one could argue, well, yeah, something similar could be developed uh, for uh, something similar to the towards the consensus could be developed for, for sort of more like descriptive features of, of society. But uh, yeah, there, there are these criticisms, right? How, how is that overlap socially robust if we deny that second part of our moral psychology? What if I'm right that in what, if, the, if the communitarian critics of Somebody to say that you're not going to get a separate independent allegiance to the principles of fairness because this is always under the good that the fair is good. So it's always going to be the different you know, conceptions of the good that are ultimately the deciding, the motivationally ultimate explanation. And that undermines that idea because it's not totally robust then in any sense. Rawls is very much concerned with modern robustness, but it seems to me that he doesn't get it out of the idea of, of a mere overlap. Especially if, if there is no independent motivation source for the overlap in area. But if it's just a relative. And it could well be, you know, that the overlap is, from this perspective, it's overlapping, but as soon as the relevant situations change, you realize that there is a gap. Uh, there is another suggestion, and 
and uh, Martin Kosch brought it to my attention, and it is a wonderful uh, concept. And uh, Hilo Rubin used it in a recent paper, brought it up again. And, and the claim here is that what we think of as sort of a basic flaw in our conception of the social world, namely that we conceive of it in different terms, is not a flaw, but itself essential. So the essential element about such words as justice, the good, the common good, uh, that's not a bug, but that's a feature, he argues. These concepts are, as he puts it, essentially contested. But, but then, of course, the, the problem is with, with bullshit. If, if, how is this different from just an equivocal use of words? If, if my conception differs from yours, we may use the same word, but how is that more than just nonsense? Our public discourse, we're just talking past each other. Now, Gary thinks, well, no, it's the, there's a difference between conception and concept. The concept is essentially contested, meaning that we have different conceptions thereof. However, there is an agreement on paradigmatic cases. Take democracy. What is democracy? It's very clean ethics, of course. Isn't it? Maybe there's some contest here, but the idea uh, proposed by Gelly is that we have these paradigmatic cases and then we have different histories of referring to these cases. But the paradigmatic cases, together with the understanding of the concept of, as being contested, sort of unify us. That's what what makes it robust. There is contest, but it is contest over concepts that, that are recognized as being essentially contested and there's going to be paradigms on which there is agreement. So we may disagree on why very clean ethics is a paradigm of democracy. For me it's, I, I don't know, uh, for you it may be something different, but there is sufficient sufficient agreement uh, for there to be more than just an equivocal use of words. However, I do not think we can be satisfied with this because of the following. We now so this is all historical and and before I had this expression, this slogan, history is bad. And that may be a bit exaggerated, but certainly given the world how it is, how it is, we cannot rely on us sharing a history for us living together. So whatever argument we have for the robustness of our being together on the different conceptions thereof cannot rely on us having a shared history. At least in principle, it's got to be open to people from different histories, or else we don't understand it, right? Okay, but nevertheless, history is important, so let me go back to history to, to see whether we find a better conception. So overlapping consensus doesn't work, essentially contested concepts doesn't really work. How does Aquinas deal with the issue? Aquinas as you know, commented extensively on Aristotle and uh, I come to appreciate Aquinas more and more. It's come to be my habit to check whenever Aristotle is at stake, I check Aquinas' comments. And he says this, and it's a comment on the passage. Nature gives speech to human beings, and speech is directed to human beings communicating with one another. Communicate is the Latin word. They do communicate. Regarding the useful and the harmful, the just and the unjust, and the like. Therefore, since nature does nothing in vain, human beings by nature communicate with one another about these things. 
But communication about these things produces the household and political community. Uh, communicatio communicare is, is the word Aquinas uses. So this concerns the third line. And uh, here is, is a, uh, a suggestion concerning how to read it. So Delun, what, what Logos does, is not the mining of general ideas, as the, the Kantians seem to think. The fundamental function of speech is to publicly establish. I, I think that's really true to the word Delun. Delos is, if it's evident, if it's obvious. Delun is make obvious. And I use public, publicly establish translation here, a social status is identical across various conceptions of the co corresponding deontology. And, and that's certainly a possibility, right? It's possible to sort of declare a status without being committed to a specific deontology thereof, right? So if university changes the, uh, the, the rights and obligations of, uh, of a professor at the University of Radek it doesn't mean that uh, Jarda isn't, isn't the professor of theoretical philosophy anymore. So that, that status remains the same through a shift of the ontology. Likewise, I want to suggest it wouldn't be just a mistake for different people to understand as the same of which they have different understandings as, as to you know, the conditions under which it holds or normative stuff attached to it. So that, that would be the thing. And it, I want to think I'm talking about politics. Politics. I don't think it works for the household because you know, for the household, I think the communitarian line is correct. We need to agree on what's good and what's useful. We cannot operate on different conceptions there. There's got to be some agreement in you know small scale cooperation, but not with regards to politics. Political community has to deal with the fact of pluralism. <coughs> it's a fact. It's always going to be around. It's not the deficiency of the political. Plurality and thus pluralism is a feature of the political. And Aristotle knows that. And, uh, and uh, the, um, the public establishment of... So, here is what I think. The common good is a social status. And it is as a status that we refer to it even though in the knowledge that we have different conceptions thereof. So this makes our talk meaningful, that it, is, it refers to a social status, and it is identical across different conceptions thereof. And the same may hold for justice, common good, and uh, many other institutional concepts. They are publicly established by labeling in such a way, it is incompatible with competing normative or descriptive conceptions. <coughs> Human political community is essential in virtue of the identity of status across different theological conceptions. So, this, of course, doesn't work in small scale interaction. It really needs sort of you know, shared understanding of what it is uh, you're out for in order to be acting together. Otherwise, it's a misunderstanding. It's not wrong. In the political community, I think that's, that's a solution that works. Or when consensus doesn't work, essentially con contest concepts don't work, but I think that works. So one step is many ontologies. I've talked long enough, I think. And I haven't got any slides left. <laughs> <laughs>
Wittgenstein puts forward, right? That something when I <laughs> well, I, 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 no, I, I, I wouldn't know if Wittgenstein had an, uh, an idea of uh, a concept of the social status that sort of allows for different conceptions thereof. But I, this is where I wanted to add a bit on it. So I think it's um, maybe, but not in the context, specific context of uh, the political life. But uh, he does make remarks about what he calls uh, agreement in form of life. In agreement in form of life, he de describes as not agreement in opinions. Yeah. And so I think, um, and I was thinking that it's already when you started, I think it's a, well, I do think that this, there is commonality here with Aristotle. Uh, well, anyway, I just wanted to yeah. say a bit more. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, agreements in form of life uh, by all means, but uh, there's got to be different forms of life that are not totally wrong or mistaken in thinking that uh, it, something is so something in their conception of their form of life is the same as something in another conception of, of another form of life. So, uh, uh, justice for me is this and that. And I know for you, and it's in that, in, embedded in your form of life, it's something different. But I know that we're still both driving at the same thing because it's an institution. Because it's sort of, yeah, a publicly established, it's ontology, the ontology is that of a publicly declared status. That's what it is, that's what step, uh, justice is. And that allows for it being something under various descriptions thereof. So it, it's got to be a special agreement of the form of life because it refers to a situation where agreement in form of life is not a very liberal conception. You know, that's, that's, that works, I hope, in your household, right? But it doesn't go much beyond, you know, maybe your neighborhood. Doesn't give you political community because the political community has to acknowledge the fact of pluralism. And Aristotle does so. So all of his communitarian interpreters who say that well we have to, to think of the same as good, that doesn't work. And Aristotle couldn't have believed it because he knows that there are different conceptions of the good. That's how he starts the whole inquiry. So. Why would he, he be committed to such a claim at the end? So I think I really think he means something like this with the delune, that's the work of logos. It brings stuff out in the open, gives it a label. And that's something social. And that has a has a reality that is now there by a delune that makes it the case that we're not totally wrong if we constantly think that we're sort of trying to drive at the same thing even though we describe it so differently. That's the, the public you know, the thing that's being created by language. Can I have a very small follow-up? Yeah. Uh, so, well, it's very nice to listen to such a description and like if I'm in the community of philosophers I would believe that there is some like uh, shared non a shared conception of public food and so on but when politicians I don't know about Austria and Switzerland <laughs> but definitely the Czech Republic start to use these words like common I think we are starting to be completely another word. Like I, I think they are using these several people who hold them would maybe have feeling that it means something like you have just been describing if you they are educated. But politicians can have totally I would say egoistic. So, how does it make the debate over it meaningful? Yeah, well, I think it, it would be very easy.
interesting to say as a philosopher about the political discourse that it is just uh, bare sounds, you know, all the rocket lines. Lots of the people say, so if you analyze this notion, so it's, it's just bundles of ideas, and you realize people have different bundles of ideas subsumed under a label, and uh, if then they, you see them talking, they are not really, you know, they're not really talking about the same thing, and that's a practice that makes no sense. So that the philosopher has the task of, you know, getting the idea straight, defining, so that real communication can start. If I'm right, that's not the task of political philosophy, because we could now see how it actually makes some sense that they have different conceptions. Because the other, you know, you, you would go Platonic, you know, Platonic king, uh, philosopher kings who, you know, they you know, all blunder, they're talking past each other, they have to define stuff, and then politics can start, right? And because we are the people who can define notions um, and can realize how nonsensical it is to operate with different conceptions and communicate with different conceptions, we should be the ones in charge. That would be pretty straightforward line of thinking uh, as a consequence of the observation how the political discourse actually works. Now if I'm right, our attitude should be different because we want not say they are well, no longer and by the way I, I don't think they are all egoistic, that's, that's probably uh, not right. They, I, I do think politicians uh, do have some understanding of what they are doing that's not only based on their income but sort of, you know, a role understanding they, they might feel special allegiance to their constituents some may be totally egoistic, but certainly not everyone not, not the ones, you know, drafting a party program and stuff like that it's, I do think it is an attempt to these people understand themselves as representatives and uh, trying to organize uh, the political stuff for, for everyone. And uh, if I'm right, they are not totally, it is not efficient in the sense I just depicted that they are using, they are having different conceptions concerning what's core to their activity. I don't think it's all bullshit if they if they say justice or the good, the common good. But they do have different conceptions thereof. But this may not be just a mistake of politics, it may be an essential feature of politics. And I think it's better to understand it as an essential feature. Because otherwise you're always tempted to you know reorganize it in a way so that no such dissent comes up. Right? Also, okay. Um, I have two points or three, but just uh, just uh, one is minor point. You suggested at some point uh, criticizing Rawls that he has now evidence, empirical evidence, for claiming that there is some kind of elements of fairness, sense of fairness in human moral psychology. So maybe Rawls didn't have, but there are people today who argue, like Tomaso, for instance, uh, that there is a in human moral psychology that there is an element of the science of premises in his new book on the natural history of human morality he basically distinguishes two layers in human moral psychology the first is sympathy which we share with the apes and so on and the yeah. second is the sense of sense of fairness so he has his whole theory based on this distinction but maybe it doesn't affect your point about rose right now who are including psychology as, 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 as you know the we humans have a specific sense of fairness in our maybe even inborn sense as they argue uh, for fairness. Yeah, so the way I understand Tomasello is saying that uh, within a joint venture there is this understanding of this not his term, exchangeability of roles. Yeah. So if we're going out for a coffee, I understand that you relate to the goal in the same way I relate to the goal. And that makes the two of us, in my view, interchangeable. So we are, we are on a par with regards to the sheer aim. And, and, and this is sort of the, the, the origin of the idea of fairness. Now this is clearly an articulation of fairness under the guise, or under the good. 
You know, it is with regards to the good of having the coffee that we are interchangeable. So that's all up my alley. It, it's a claim that, because once you realize, well, uh, you have a different conception of the goal, I'm not going to be fair anymore. Right? Because then I realize it, it's, it's, it's all a blunder. We're not in this together, and thereby I lose the foundation of fairness. Rawls wants to have it robust, you know, it is sort of independent of the good. So, you mean that there is a priority of value of the good over fairness? Yeah, and, yeah. and you mean yeah. that Thomas Sowell's conception is compatible with that? Yes, I, 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 I want to argue that what Thomas Sowell says is compatible with my critique of this Rawlsian idea of fairness being sort of independent of conceptions of the good. Because the way Tomasello derives the idea of fairness is clearly from within a joint venture which is directed at a common good. So, oh, okay. so it, it, it's clear in Tomasello why it is good to be fair, because we can do stuff together. Now if it turns out that we're not really doing anything together because we have different conceptions of the goal, there is no motivation to be fair anymore. So it doesn't give what, what Ross wants to have. Okay, okay, I understand the point. And then just from a naturalistic pers perspective, so I like this summarization uh, at the end of the presentation of the three lines, when three lines are visited. So uh, I wonder if you would dare to propose that language or logos uh, as a means of labeling general values, so maybe we could add norms, because there is also right and wrong or something like that. Uh, which are the contents of human unique cognition could have evolved precisely for the purpose. So, would you speculate that what, what language logos is for? So, maybe that it could be a, a kind of evolutionary speculation that language or some proto languages evolved precisely because they enabled early humans to proto label such kind of general values or norms. Because there are such theories. That language basically evolved. Well, it it strikes me as a bit weird that the reason why we have language is so that we are able sitting around the fire to say justice. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> we probably wanted to tell stories. Yeah, right? Didn't we give it such grand values? Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's, it's in this uh, line with communication, uh, general values. So. Well, and, and, and in the Aristotle, in the Aristotle, I mean, I, I, this was amazing, I'm definitely going to look into it, and, and the Aquinas discussion, that humans are more social because of speech, and that it's what lets us discuss right and wrong, good and bad. So there, it does look like that the sociality, the collective nature is because of speech, and that's something that ratchets us up to the normative, it seems like. So there, there's this idea, for instance, that Giada, President Preston, elaborated in his own way, the language might have been other, other means of normalization or something like that, so suppressing some too much of flexibility and so on. So it's, of course, it's speculation, but that would be kind of normative, pragmatist friendly elaboration of Aristotelian lines. So. I find it remarkable that in this, uh, or it's really a paraphrase right, of the Aristotelian lines. Uh, Aquinas wouldn't use the word ratio as a translation of logos. He doesn't talk of ratio, but of communication. It's, it's really, so logos has both, right? It's sort of logos ratio and logos speech. And he decidedly goes into the communication thing and not in the irrational structure of you know, general concepts talking to each other, but it's it, granted, it's talk about uh, communication in Istis, Istis being utili et nocivo, the useful and the, the detrimental, justo et injusto, and the good and bad he doesn't even mention. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Because I guess to make a come to mind will translate almost decidedly as ratio. Reason. Theory is communication. Is this a follow-up? We have we have a number of questions but quickly. Yes. Look, how would can we make sense of this without saying something about uh, agreement in reason or agreement in logic or something? Because if we are discussing the ontology that 
within a Cartesian mind, then nobody knows what is behind my bare sounds which I edit. But I think that this is not a reasonable picture, that uh, my conception of something is not independent with what I do, with what I say, and so on. So uh, in, in this way it seems to me that uh, uh, what I admit are, are not bare sounds, but also part of the uh, conceptions which I have. Yeah, I mean, the best bit of your strategy, the opponent is always the Cartesian, but I, I don't mean that these are private, privately held okay. communities, of course these are communities, but no, there's, there's different communities out there, you know. It's very different. It's not that, you know, since it's communal, everyone has it. It's different communities. Yeah, but, but uh, we can find out whether the uh, conceptions overlap via communication. Yeah, but how could we communicate if we use the words? Yeah. If the conceptions yeah. that we uh, uh, that we have are different, you know, that's the thing. How could communication be something meaningful if there is different conceptions of what we're talking about? Recall the, the well, I didn't present the log thing. You know. Uh, he that applies his name to ideas different from their common use, wants propriety in language and speaks gibberish for all such words, however, put into mm -hmm. this course according to the right construction of grammatical rules of the harmony of well tuned periods, to yet amount to nothing but bare sounds and nothing else. And, yeah. and you know, this, this philosophy is all about, you know, performing the right bundling of ideas and the words. Yeah. So, but, but, for example, democracy, you know, for you guys, it's casting your vote every four or five years. You know, I, I wouldn't call it democracy, but still, <laughs> we're talking about it's <laughs> electoral oligarchy, right? Yeah, that's what it is, right? It's, you can get rid of the regime. That's, uh, yeah, so, so there is this sort of controversy. Also with justice. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it seems to me that the meaning of somebody's work, democracy, is discernible by inspecting the ways he uh, or she uses it uh, from his linguistic and also non-linguistic practices. So we can align our usages uh, and we can know that we mean the same thing because our linguistic practices interlock in a certain in a certain way. It's How important. does it interlock? I mean, you're, you're saying there is this is sort of maybe the overlapping consensus. It just so happens that we have a sufficient overlap that there's at least some meaning in the communication. But but uh, what we should do in the political discourse is first have a discussion on what we mean by by justice and so on. So that would be a, a version of the philosopher Kingley, where political task is to get the idea straight first. If I'm right, that's not what we should do. We should be doing. We should let the political discourse run as it does, because there is no worry about it being meaningless, filling each other's ears with bigger sound, because it's part and parcel of what social justice, etc., is, and it is contested in that way. So that's a different attitude, you know, as a consequence of seeing these, the isthesis of these ideas differently. I'm not sure I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, 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 I think if somebody makes noise without any sense of signification, I can find out relatively quickly. Yeah, but you need to find out first before it might start to make sense. If no, that's the requirement really for political discussion, well, you, you guys, we're going to close off the doors, we're going to agree on all the terms in the Constitution first, oh. and then we can make more. Oh, that's not, not, not how it works, of course. So. Yeah. So how, but how does it work? Is it merely incidental? That of course, uh, of course, that uh, the pursuit of meaning and the pursuit of truth, as Maurice Schrick would put it, are not two independent enterprises. We are inter intertwined uh, in, in our communicative practices, so yeah, it's, it's not possible to first to find out about meanings and then use them. It's uh, in one package, I, but, but that's how it works, it seems to me. I, I don't think that uh, liberal democracy works under the ideal of finally coming to the, the agreed upon concept of justice and the good. I think that's a misunderstanding of especially liberal democracy. You would, you would see it all as sort of, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not good because what they are doing is obviously not to agree on a conception. They are fighting over issues under different conceptions of the common good and justice and so on. I'm saying that's okay. The way it works is okay. okay it's so not a mistake that they are not opening a philosophical seminar yeah. where they try to agree on the concept of justice. So See the difference? So, so do we have any quarrel? Yeah, I, I still think you want them to, to sit down and talk about... Don't you think there's disagreement? I think we disagree. I, it doesn't seem to me that there needs to be. It, it seems perfectly reasonable to suppose that, uh, I don't know if this is Swift's metaphor, but another positive metaphor about being in the raft at sea, that we're, we're constantly engaged in a, in, a, in a practice of trying to triangulate our political commitments and virtue of disagreements about what counts as what's good or what's just. But then in the process of doing that, we, in the ideal cases, and we always have to leave open the possibility that we're wrong, but that in doing that, we start to come to some agreement about what it is to be good or to be just for us. That's not the, the, you know, the fact of pluralism in the political goes deeper. It's, just, it's not just that we happen to disagree, so let's work it out while we're working. Pluralism is always going to be around. And the way we live together is to allow for it. So it's not a deficiency in the process okay. that we have yeah. to deal with while we're working together. Yeah. That's true. In, in, you know, in, 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 in smaller scale corporations, in the living together in the household, that's true. 
because that's not you know we, we, we need to be operating on the on the same conception of what it is or joint activity is about, otherwise it's not gonna be mostly robust. That your partner's gonna leave you as soon as incident as circumstances are such that the difference in conception of, of the purpose can, becomes apparent. But that cannot be the case for the political. So there's this thing about the fact of pluralism. You know, it cannot be just a deficiency or something that, yeah, too bad, but we sort of have to live with it. It's got to be part and parcel of the form of living together, the political form of living together. I think that's what many, uh, you know, what's a reasonable view concerning the difference between small scale cooperation and political community. This is? Yeah, last question. Yeah. Uh, but in, in the first place, I think that this problem does not only affect to moral or political concepts, but basically all concepts can be subject to, to this problem. And I don't know how this universality of the phenomenon of ambiguity, so to say, would affect uh, your argument. And a very short question, could you go back to the Kantian interpretation? Uh, yes, uh, uh, regarding the useful and the detrimental, uh, I, uh, I I agree with that. Uh, this is a, a distinction, something that allows to differentiate the concept of the useful from the concept of pain and pleasure. Uh, but another difference is perhaps that the useful and detrimental, as compared to pain and pleasure, do not refer to actual, to present pain and pressure, but to things that may cause pain and pressure in the future. And so we may need language in order to uh, discuss what will happen in the future, something that the, the animals with just the voice cannot, cannot do. And this would not be affected perhaps by the, the problem you mentioned. Yeah. And, and just one very, very brief, I, I think that one interesting point to discuss would be what is the role of the house in the in the Aristotelian text? Uh, because um, in particular, all modern authors you mention forget everything about the house and only about society, not only in the city but society. In the, but why it seems that Aristotle is so <coughs> interested in the house? Uh, as, as, as yeah, well, it starts the, uh, the politics with with. Uh, a taxonomy of forms of koinonia. And he says uh, there is a, there is a master slave, there is a husband wife. So he defines koinonia as shared activity uh, um, for some good. And the good in master slave is uh, you know the, uh, the, uh, the basic production. And uh, husband wife it's reproduction. Uh, household is surviving and politics is it's the good life. So there are different goods under which we are uh, living together, in which we are jointly, jointly active. Now, I, I think he made a mistake, he shouldn't have mentioned the household here because <laughs> and he, he, he emphasizes a great deal oh, right. that we shouldn't conceive, you know, this whole early modern conception, late medieval and early modern conception of politics as an extended family. Mm -hmm. That was so, you know, the patriarchal uh, view, that was so, you know, the, the argument for monarchy that followed this time. It's deeply anti Aristotelian because it, it sort of mixes up types of, of community. That's why I find it, it a little bit disappointing that Aristotle says, well, it's the same, you know, nice disease of the good and the bad and makes the household end. But, but I, I, I think another interpretation that is that he introduces here the reference to the house because he is talking about speech, about the logos, and of course, a human beings that don't live in cities, but the barbarians, they live in houses that live in cities, they have logos. So there must be something in logos that does, that does not require the existence of the city in itself. It's more primitive. Yeah, well, he would probably say that, yeah, that, that's not the conception of uh, politics that's friendly yeah, sure, to sure. nomadic people, that certainly has a concept of 
you know, the policy is that which, which is economically self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And you would probably say, well, these are really traders or something, you know, if, if, if this is what they do, so they are not a, a unity by themselves. So they should be conceived of in a framework that makes uh, that life self-sufficient, that produces everything that it needs. So it, it would be just a part, it would not be a political community because it depends on the interactions. Whether, if, if it's a nomadic form of life that not, doesn't depend on trade, I think you could say, well, no, it's just a mobile city. That, that could be. Concerning the, the future thing, uh, so, yeah, I, I find this promising, but how is that then different from useful and detrimental? Because you could say something is useful for avoiding future pain. I mean, it seems to involve some general notion, right? This is, this is painful, not in, in the sense this now makes, uh, this now hurts me, but this is generally painful, right? That would be a general concept. doesn't need uh, the discussion whether the concept of useful is shared or not. Basically, yeah. we can assume that it is shared, everybody knows what is pain, and everybody knows what it means that it's future pain. Yeah, so we have a general concept of pain, but I think when he talks about the phone of animals, he thinks that if it hurts, they're going to cry out. Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's not that they sort of cognize the, the general property of causing pain and signal that general property. No, just, the, you know, the, the fact is that some things, for example, may cause pleasure now and cause pain in the future. And without logos, we cannot explain that to our children or our... Yeah. Uh, so there's some downward effect of logos that then even our uh, cognition of pain becomes different. Mm -hmm. So let's thank our speaker. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you for the, the conversation, for the discussion, for the continuing this. I do think there's, there's beginning to be some convergence. Um, and I wanted to thank in particular uh, Miguel and Petter. They did a lot of work both yesterday and today to make sure that everything came off smoothly. So, um, let's give them a <laughs> There's some talk about trying to find a journal crazy enough to bundle these papers together and publish them. So, we will be in touch about whether or not that comes out. We'll see how it goes.